Are we seeing a new stage in the Ukraine war? Just this week, the United States and Germany have announced that they will supply tanks to Ukraine. They were, Germany has also announced that its tanks, which are held by other countries, can also be supplied to Ukraine. But will this actually make a difference on the ground? What are the other geopolitical implications of these decisions? We'll be discussing all this in this episode of Mapping Fault Lines. We're joined by Prabir Prakashastar. Prabir, so, uh, of course, the immediate question that has, uh, you know, many people have had when they heard about this news was that, is this going to make a difference? Of course, we don't predict military developments too much. But nonetheless, uh, this, it's a substantial number of tanks when you put all of it together, the Abrams tanks, the Leopard tanks, etc. So, uh, how do you see actually these being deployed and in, how does it actually affect the battlefield? So there are three elements to the question which I would like to take separately. Let's take the narrowest one first. What is the effect immediately on the battlefield if such a large number of tanks are put on again? Ukraine had tanks earlier. It had its T-72 tanks, Soviet vintage, which Ukraine later on developed some more. That was one lot, which got destroyed in the first phase of the war itself. And the second set, which came in when all the ex-Soviet tanks, the Soviet tanks were held by the ex-Soviet uh, allies, were donated to Ukraine again came from Poland, it came from other countries, uh, there are a lot of them. It was also held in stock by a number of other countries who were not a part of the Soviet bloc, but had bought some of the T-72 tanks. Those lot also went into war and they did also get destroyed. So largely Ukraine is now trying to build a third tank army. And in this, the number of tanks that have come in, uh, they seem to be about 100 odd, if not more, because 75 were coming from Poland alone. Uh, about 15, 20 could come from uh, Germany. 14 have come from the from the UK, the Challenger tanks. Abrams, we don't know when they will come, but if they come, they also may be at least 20, 25. We don't know what the numbers are going to be. But all of this means they are going to be with all the other armored personal carriers, armored vehicles that are coming in. We are looking something like about 100 tanks at least, and about another three, two to 300 uh, personal car armored personal carriers and so on. So this is a large formation. And if you look at the map, and you have this map here, you can see that this is the front line which is taking place uh, now, which is between Ukraine and Russia. And if you take Crimea as the most strategic part of it, is it possible for then Ukraine using arms to tank armies supported by personal carriers to make a thrust and bisect in a way this region, which is the Kherson, Zaplosia, uh, Donbass, somewhere so that the Crimean, Crimean link, Crimea to Russia, the link is broken. And therefore, Crimea becomes a possibility of then quote unquote liberation of Crimea as the NATO would really like it to be because Crimea Sebastopol is a big base for the Russians, naval base. It's the only warm water port that they have, a naval base that they have. Therefore, that would be a huge blow to the Russians if that falls. So would that put Crimea back into play? So I think militarily that is one of the things Ukraine is banking upon. And a part of this calculation is also NATO's calculation, the United States particularly, that this will give leverage to Ukraine to bargain with Russia if they pose such a threat. Right. Therefore, the use of tanks, now armored uh, brigades and so on, might lead to a changing. And they calculate, their basic calculation is, last time they gave HIMARS and other uh, military weapons, Ukraine was able to do a limited breakthrough, as you can see, in the Kharkov area and also in Kherson area. So can that be further enlarged if new weapon systems are given? And will that lead to a change, qualitative change in the world theater and therefore the role of Crimea in this, uh, in this larger strategic consideration? That seems to be a possible calculation because otherwise the war, if it continues, has two major threats. One is to the destruction of Ukraine itself, because if the infrastructure continues to degrade as it is doing right now, and this winter may be very hard on the Ukrainian people, 
then it is a possibility that Ukraine to recover from this war is not going to be easy. And the amount of financial and other support it will take, which already the Ukraine has exhausted a large part of the financial goodwill of the people because they've already funded a huge amount. 100 billion is the amount that we have, that's being talked about, which has already come in, and that's up to no, up to November. Right. So na- last three months, again, more money has come in. So if we put all of it together, how much of the goodwill of the people will stay to support Ukraine continuously at this scale is an issue. So Ukraine is in danger of disintegration in this war continues. And the second part of it is that, of course, you know, this is directly now a war between NATO and, you, and uh, Russia. And therefore, when you have German tanks going up against Russia, the impact of this on Russia is tremendous because there are pictures of the world war where the German tank armies came into Russia is still there in their minds. This is not a picture which Germany wanted, and it's not a picture which is in favor of a longer term solution to the Ukrainian problem. And therefore, this route that they're taking has the danger of spiraling out of control. At any point, you have NATO, which is, of course, the three countries in NATO who have nuclear weapons. United States, of course, being the primary one. And of course, Russia has nuclear weapons. They have the ability to destroy the whole world. So this seems to be one upmanship. I won't call that as one upmanship, but it is getting into very dangerous waters. And therefore, both the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, oh. the clock now, Doomsday clock. Doomsday clock is now the shortest uh, that you can talk about in terms of spa- how far away we are from Armageddon. And also, as you can see, that uh, the space between two nuclear powers is not there. They're both right. all fighting face to face. NATO armory, uh, NATO troops are not there. But for, but for all practical purposes, it's NATO versus Russia, direct physical confrontation. This does not seem to give us any path to retreat by either powers. It locks NATO and Russia into this military struggle. And unless it gets destroyed, NATO forces get again destroyed, doesn't win any victories, even if it is sort of maintains the same borders that is now we see on the ground over here. And there is no major change in that. If that happens, then I think we are going to see some tough times for Ukraine, for the world. And I think that peace is going to become increasingly more difficult. Of course, you can say that if Ukraine and NATO decisively loses, then there is a possibility of peace. I'm not so sure about that. Absolutely. Right, Prabhu, in this context, a key question was Germany's decision. Because I think ever since the war started, the position and the approach, the attitude of Germany has really been the central question. At times, it has seemed that Germany has been more reluctant uh, to sort of take a, you know, a very confrontationalist stance. Or there, have been, there seem to be divisions within Germany itself, the government itself. Uh, but with this move, does it mark, uh, you know, a categorical statement, you know, a position of no going back as far as Germany is concerned? You know, in politics and war, there is no such position as no going back. Right. So I would not say that this is a decisive shift which locks every country onto war. Temporarily, yes. It's also true that there have been sections in Germany, in France, who are more gung-ho about getting into the war and less gung-ho about getting into the war. They have been more cautious. And if we take Germany, then the Green Party has been somehow the most radical in terms of wanting a war. As you can see, the foreign minister of Germany says, we are at war with Russia. Now, that is a statement which is extremely dangerous because it's not made by a journalist, it's made by the foreign minister of Germany with a certain official, therefore, sanctity to the statement. Now, Germany doesn't consider itself that it's a war with Russia. Neither does Russia consider Germany is at war with uh, Russia. So, given that, the it's very clear that the Green Party, of which the current foreign minister is a representative, that she that they are much more gung-ho about a fight with Russia than others are. I, I don't know why it could be possibly that, you know, getting out of the 
energy, gas and energy, fossil energy, uh, coal, which also comes from Russia, that this might be a good way to do it through a war. I don't know if that is the larger ideological shift which is there or being directly much more aligned to the United States. But it is, there are forces in Germany, there are forces in France, and there is a large underlying reluctance in these countries to prolong the war forever. There is uh, slowly what we seem to say a war weariness mm -hmm. which is setting in because the cost of the war is being borne by the West European Union. Uh, America has borne the cost of war in terms of getting a lot of arms and weapons, but nevertheless it's also made a killing out of selling oil at a high price to the European Union. So therefore, both sides are not even as far as the war goes in terms of the impact on their economies. Given that, European Union is likely to tire earlier about on the war, but they don't seem to have much leeway in decision making as it stands. And though they did say no tanks till America gives its tanks. So effectively, in spite of all the things that are being said about German, Germany looking bad, Scholz looking weak and so on, the reality is the United States has also committed tax. Now, one could be, of course, a calculated question that Germany didn't want to lose its tank market. Right. Globally, it sells a lot of this Leopold tanks leopard tanks yes. and uh, leopard tanks. And if uh, it shows up as not so good, and if you, Russia is able to take them out, then immediately it drops in market value. And therefore, the Abrams become the tank then for the other side. So all the NATO allies and other friends will start looking at that as a solution. So their argument could be, if I have to cut off my tail, so will you. So this is the uh, argument that seems to have gone on. If I commit leopard, you commit your Abraham. So if we are shown up that we cannot face the Russian tanks or we suffer losses against the Russian tanks, I suspect both sides will. In that case, Abrams also will uh, suffer losses, particularly Abrams has the other problem. It was made really for desert conditions, right. much more than the snowy winter conditions they're going to face in uh, Ukraine. So it may not be the best tank, as the Americans also have been saying. But one part of it is clear that either way, whatever the terrain, whatever the weather, tanks are not invincible today. We have seen, for instance, the Houthis take, take out Abraham tanks. We have seen the ISIS-aligned forces take out uh, leopard tanks, which Turkey uh, used in uh, Syria. So these are not, not invincible. And we have discussed this earlier. Asymmetric war means it's easier to take out large pieces of equipment, whether it be warships, whether it be uh, tanks, that the 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 balance seemed to have shifted if in favor of such offensive weapons and the defense against such weapons are actually weaker today. So given that, I don't think the tanks are going to make it much of a difference in the long term. In the short term, is it possible to break through the Russian lines and therefore create a crisis for Crimea, create a crisis for Zaporizhia, create a crisis for Kherson? Right. These are the questions which we have to see in the future. Uh, I don't think that the Bakhmut line, the Ukrainians are going to be able to retrieve over there. So that, I think, Donbass region, I think, is going to be in Russia's hands sooner rather than later. I don't think the tanks are going to make a difference, but in these areas, it could make a difference, so that we'll have to see. But I do think that uh, essentially that the tanks in the long run are not going to make a difference. Maybe in a short term, say one, two months, they may, they may make, Ukraine may make some gains, but ultimately it's the people that is there and Ukraine is running short of essentially, essentially soldiers who can be trained in this period to handle complex war maneuvers, which is what tank armies call for. They're not just tanks, right. parcel, personal carrier tanks, integration with other uh, forces, integration with how you see the, the whole war theater and how you are able to do combined war operations. These are the key issues. And two to three months, four months training is not going to be enough, perhaps for that. Tanks require, if you want to be somebody who can use it effectively, it requires some time. And how many tank commanders who were there, the T-72s, are still surviving to be able to do this? That's a key question. Key question right? Unless you have NATO uh, also coming in with uh, soldiers. I'm actually sending soldiers. Send soldiers, which could come in as uh, 
officially mercenaries, but actually NATO seconded personnel. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Prabir, for talking to us. So uh, there we have it. Yet another bleak episode, unfortunately, as the war might, like Prabir said, at least escalate in the short term. We'll be covering some of these developments in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.